Good afternoon. Thank you for joining our monthly Lunch and Learn, our very special monthly Lunch and Learn. Today, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Jennifer ross Zell, a historian with the Johnson Space Center. We are so grateful to have you to join us today. Um, you have told us a little bit about yourself, but if you want to give us just a little bit more, please do, and then go right into your presentation. Sure. So I'm Jennifer ross I've served as the NASA Johnson Space Center historian since December of 2004. I have a PhD in history from Washington State University. I don't know if anybody is on uh, from the Northwest. I do see a name that's familiar, though. Nice to see you in here, Jim. Uh, we've worked together in the past. Um, like I said, I, I'm the author of Winning the West for Women, which is a biography of Emma Smith DeVoe, a suffragist. I've actually spent some time in Kansas doing some research on her. Uh, she spent some time in your state uh, stumping for suffrage. All right. Somebody grew up in Western Washington, uh, although I was on the east side of the state, but I did live in Tacoma for a while when I was a kid. Um, and then I have a new book coming out called Making Space for Women that's coming out through Texas A&M Press. And I think I saw somebody coming in here who had Texas A&M on their photograph. So if you're interested, I can put that in the link when we're finished. So you're probably wondering uh, what I'm going to talk about here today. Apologize, I use my hands and you can't see me very well when I do that. I'm going to be talking about President Dwight D. Eisenhower and the impact of Sputnik on his presidency. And what I really want to do is I want to explore how that launch and his response really left him politically vulnerable. Um, and, I, and it really forced him to create NASA, which was something he didn't necessarily want to do. He was forced to do. He was put in that position. And I think in doing so, he inadvertently helped to create a space race, which he never wanted, and the Apollo program. So with that, we can get started. If I can get the next slide, Samantha. I'm sorry, I just realized we weren't on the uh, slide. So if I can get the next slide with Sputnik. There we go. Okay, so you all probably know that Sputnik was launched on October 5th, 1957. Uh, it was the world's first artificial satellite and its launch really had a tremendous impact on the United States and the world, really. Uh, you see it here, this is a replica. It's an aluminum sphere. It's about 22 inches. Uh, it weighed about 183 pounds and circled the globe every 96 minutes. Uh, on the evening that it was launched, the Soviet Union uh, was actually hosting um, a meeting in their embassy in Washington, DC. Uh, the Americans were also there. They were there for the conclusion of a week long meeting of the IGY. And uh, they heard, the Americans heard at this point about the launch of Sputnik. And so one of the people in attendance there uh, who was part of the conference tracked down another representative, the official delegate uh, for the committee. And he said, it's up. They were expecting this to happen. And Lloyd Berkner, who was uh, America's official representative to the international committee, acknowledge the work of the Soviets. He basically gave a toast. He, uh, he said, I wish to make an announcement. I've just been informed by the New York Times that a Russian satellite is in orbit at an elevation of 900 kilometers. I wish to congratulate our Soviet colleagues on their achievement. Well, Eisenhower was not in attendance at that point, but he really wasn't concerned. Uh, he was actually in Gettysburg for the weekend. Uh, he did not issue any press releases. He did not meet with the media. Uh, in fact, he spent most of the weekend looking after his cattle. Uh, he played golf and he toured a nearby pig farm. Nothing says, I'm not concerned like visiting a pig farm. Uh, he spent the night with his family. Um, it really seemed inconsequential to him and his administration. And the reason why is because he actually knew what was going on behind the scenes in the Soviet Union, thanks to the U-2 spy plane. Even the president of the National Academy of Sciences at the time said he didn't think there was any reason for the United States to change its plans in response to what was happening in the Soviet Union every time that happened. But certainly there were other people who were more concerned. If we can get the next slide. So as you see here, the launch of Sputnik uh, really made worldwide headlines like you see here. And it was truly a propaganda coup for the Soviet Union and Khrushchev. 
And for many people, when they heard about the launch of Sputnik, it really was a grave concern. So let's hear from two people who remember the event and its impact on American society. The first person we're gonna hear from is Eileen Galloway, who was working for the Congressional Research Services. So we'll start with her. She's on the very left-hand side there, Samantha. So uh, it came to us as a problem in national defense because it showed that they had the capability of launching intercontinental. Oh. <laughs> we'll give it a sec. It missiles. And it, there was fear throughout the world for that reason because the satellite was going around at 90 miles, uh, I mean 90, every 90 minutes it circled the earth and um, everyone was really frightened. And so it, because it appeared as a problem in national defense, the p first people who looked after it in the Senate was the Senate Armed Services Committee Okay, and I also want to play the next clip from Simon Ramo of Ramo and Woldridge, which was an aerospace company. He said, if you can get it to work, Samantha, I don't know if you can. I felt there were only two other occasions I had experienced the Lindbergh's landing in Paris when I was a teenager, I guess, about that time. FDR's death and the Sputnik. In terms of the nation being aroused and feeling something very fundamental, something earth-shaking, something that's going to change things in a major way affecting all of us, going to take place. This is an enormous reaction. I so internationally, I mean, this had a huge impact as well. The United States was a superpower, but people were starting to have doubts. They began to wonder about the U.S. standing. For instance, the Japanese Liberal Democrats wanted to start pushing the Americans off of the island. Um, and really, I think overnight, the Soviet Union became this superpower to be feared. We often thought of them as uh, this backward nation, but now I think we thought of them as an actual rival to the United States. So if we can have the next slide. Can we get the next slide, Samantha? Yeah. Okay, so for some people, this moment was really exhilarating. It was really exciting. And this is NASA engineer Homer Hickam. Um, let's hear from him what he, he remembers of those days. Most of our country, a terrifying moment because uh, most of us, uh, most of the people in the United States looked at it as a military defeat. The Russians had a rocket that could put something into space, into orbit, and we didn't have a rocket that big that could do it. So we were very worried. They've got to remember, we're right in the middle of the Cold War. People were worried about nuclear warfare and annihilation. So it was very scary, but it wasn't for, for some reason for us boys in cold. Well, the reason was that we were big science fiction readers. We had read tons of science fiction. Now, I have to confess to you that in the process of reading that science fiction, I really thought it was fiction. I thought that maybe we might get something into space uh, in my lifetime, maybe. Uh, or, or it wouldn't have surprised me if we didn't. Maybe it's 100 years, 200 years off. And all of a sudden, there it was. It had actually happened. So I was fascinated about it from that standpoint. Uh, I was fascinated by the fact it looked like a great space race was about to develop between the United States and Russia. I thought, now that's going to be fun, uh, to, to, and I want to be part of that. And, uh, but uh, Sputnik itself, it was Sputnik that I saw fly over Colwood. Now, the aspect of that really turned my brain around because my whole life, it seemed to me that, that, the world was kind of in two parts. Everything that happened in Colwood, which was fascinating to me, but everything that happened outside of Colwood, and they didn't mesh. But all of a sudden, here was the biggest thing that was happening in the world 
was coming to Colwood. It was actually going to fly over Colwood. I could go out in my backyard and look up and see Sputnik that everybody in the world was talking about. So uh, needless to say, that, uh, that uh, really energized me to be part of that. Now, I have to say, when I went out into the backyard to watch Sputnik fly over and the rest of the town came to see it, my dad walked out and saw my mom out there and he said, Elsie, why is everybody out in our backyard? And, and she said, well, Homer, I'm Homer Jr. And she said, Homer, uh, uh, we're out here with Sonny, which is what they call me, to watch uh, Sputnik fly over. And my dad said, well, President Eisenhower would never allow anything Russian to fly over Coldwood. <laughs> and he put on his hat and went to the mine and never even looked up. <laughs> So, of course, I had to include that last little bit. I thought that was rather humorous. Uh, but, of course, he went on to become a NASA engineer. We can have the next slide. So, you know, for many, at least the media in particular, there was a lot of concern that maybe the U.S. hadn't been watching the Soviets closely enough, as you can see here by... Uh, these political cartoons. We'd been asleep or complacent, as you see Uncle Sam just woke up from the beep of uh, Sputnik, and it really took Sputnik to wake us up. If we can have the next slide. And there were also concerns that we were really lagging behind, as you see here, we wonder why we're not keeping pace. Well, there was a sense that the Russians really were sprinting ahead of us. Uh, there was a common belief that there was a problem with our schools in particular because they were focusing mainly on life adjustment, uh, you know, football games, clubs, fun. We weren't really training kids in science, uh, history, language arts, uh, mathematics. We were really lagging behind. The Soviet Union, by contrast, the media tended to portray as someone who really focused on uh, engineering, mathematics, science. Um, and I wonder to you, does this sound familiar to discussions you've heard today about our educational system? But the media was also especially critical of Eisenhower for spending most of his days golfing while the country appeared to be in danger of losing its scientific authority. If we can get the uh, next slide, please. So I want to go back and just briefly talk for a few minutes um, about how Sputnik came to be. Now, in July of 1955, the United States and the Soviet Union agreed to launch artificial sites, artificial satellites, rather, excuse me, around the Earth to learn more about our planet. And the United States uh, decided to go with a satellite that the Navy had proposed that they wanted to put a scientific um, uh, package around the Earth, and the Army protested. They actually wanted to send a satellite on board their modified Redstone missile. Well, President Eisenhower didn't want to see that happen. He wanted actually this to be a very scientific effort. If the military was involved, he was worried that they wouldn't be able to share the scientific findings uh, with the scientists, and uh, he also did not want to weaponize space. But the Army insisted that they could actually launch the satellite a year sooner than the Navy. Um, they knew the Eisenhower administration understand that there might be some risk that the Soviet Union would be the first to actually launch a satellite in space. Uh, there were concerns that if the Navy satellite called Vanguard failed, it would result in a loss of uh, UN, U.S. scientific prestige. Um, but the Department of Defense decided they didn't want to give up any uh, rockets. They were afraid that it might impact the missile effort that was going on at that point. And Eisenhower really agreed with it. He said, there's no reason to have a crash program at this point. It doesn't warrant it. Uh, we don't need to interfere with scientists and their timetable. And really, in looking back during his presidential years and his memoir, we see Eisenhower talking about this satellite program and he said it was completely unrelated to missile development in the beginning. It wasn't established as a race or a contest with any nation, the Soviet Union in particular. It really was supposed to be a gift to the scientific community of the world. So if I can get the next slide, please. Now, many people 
don't know this, but the, the Soviet Union didn't hide their plans. It wasn't hidden. Uh, if you were an American who read a newspaper on a regular basis, which most Americans did in the 1950s, uh, you would have read about this. This was um, covered by newspapers. These are two articles from the New York Times that I've, I've pasted here. Um, in, in 1957, they actually publicly announced their plans to launch a satellite. Uh, on the left, you see this article by Walter uh, Sullivan, and he announced the Soviet Earth satellite may contain a flashing light to mark its path across the night sky for all people of the world. This was in 1957. So the launch of the satellite wasn't a surprise to all Americans. And in fact, contrary to the sort of narrative that we always hear, there were some Americans who, of course, were concerned, but not many people were that panicked. If I can get the next slide. So what I want to do is I want to show you a portion of this press conference from Ike. I apologize, I couldn't find a, a cleaner version. This is, has, has a lot of text on it. Um, but this is his first conference uh, following Sputnik. And you'll see he's not you know, really a great speaker, but one thing I noticed from this is how calm he is, how unconcerned he is. So let's listen and see what he has to say. In July 1955, there was a White House press conference participated in by representatives of the National Science Foundation and the National Academy of Science. It was announced that plans are going forward for the launching of small, unmanned, Earth-circling satellites as part of the United States and the International Year. It takes place between July 1957 and December 1958. And the data will be made available to all students throughout the world. The National Science Foundation, it was also announced, would work with the United States National Committee for the International Geophysical Year to formulate plans for the satellite and its instrumentation, as well as plans for the preparation and deployment of the ground observer equipment required for the program. In May of 1957, those charged with the United States satellite program determined that small satellite spheres would be launched as test vehicles during 1957 to check the rocketry, instrumentation, and ground station, and that the first fully instrumented satellite would be launched in March of 1958. The first of these test vehicles is planned to be launched in December of this year. As to the Soviet satellite, we congratulate Soviet scientists upon putting a satellite into orbit. The United States satellite program has been designed from its inception for maximum results in scientific research. The scheduling of this program has been described to and closely coordinated with the International Geophysical Year scientists of all countries. As a result of passing full information on our project to the scientists of the world, immediate tracking of the United States satellite will be possible, and the world scientists will know at once its orbit and the appropriate time for observation. The rocketry employed by our Naval Research Laboratory for launching our Vanguard has been deliberately separated from our ballistic missile effort in order, first, to accent the scientific purposes of the satellite, and second, to avoid interference with top priority missile programs. Merging of this scientific effort with military programs could have produced an orbiting United States satellite before now, but to the detriment of scientific goals and military progress. Vanguard, for the reasons indicated, has not had equal priority with that accorded our ballistic missile work. Speed of progress in the satellite project cannot be taken as an index of our progress in ballistic missile work. Our satellite program has never been conducted as a race with other nations. Rather, it has been carefully scheduled as part of the scientific work 
of the international geophysical year. I consider our country's satellite program to be well designed and properly scheduled to achieve the scientific purposes for which it was initiated. We are, therefore, carrying the program forward in keeping with our arrangements with the international scientific community. I just, I, I love watching clips from the, from the past. To me, it's very interesting. I didn't include all of it. It's, it's uh, from what I could find, there was about a 10 minute clip that was made available on YouTube. But what, what was interesting to me is he also talks about the fact that, that he wasn't all that impressed because the Soviets just put a small ball in the air, um, which suggests to me that, you know, he sort of thought of this as almost as a toy. Um, but he also expressed the fact that he wasn't concerned, not one iota. He's not, he wasn't apprehensive. Um, he made the case that Sputnik didn't result in any new discoveries. He didn't think it was a threat to the United States. He saw, in short, no reason for America to get excited about this launch. Uh, our security wasn't under threat, as some, some had suggested, some in the media, some politicians. But there still was this great fear that there was a missile gap between the Soviet Union and the United States. And as I mentioned, he wasn't concerned because he had seen photographs from a U-2 spy plane to show that there really wasn't a missile gap. Uh, but he refused to release this source. Uh, he was actually encouraged to do so, but he refused to do so. So as a result, politicians, public officials, the media, sci even scientists themselves, started to debate different ways that we could uh, expand into space. But Eisenhower himself did not want a new program. He didn't want any, what he called crash programs um, to deal with what he saw as a minor crisis, the Sputnik crisis. Uh, he did not want to go into debt. Uh, he did not want a huge federal deficit. Uh, he wanted to keep the country from going hog wild, basically from embarking on foolish, costly schemes that he didn't think the nation really needed. Uh, he wanted some sort of balance. Uh, he wanted a balanced approach to this crisis. Um, he had seen what was going on in the Soviet Union in terms of their ICBM development, uh, and he really didn't feel there was any sort of grave peril. He thought that maybe they were a few months ahead of us, uh, but not that much. Uh, you can imagine how... Um, challenging this must have been, how frustrating it must have been for him to know what he knew but not share it with the American public. Uh, not all presidents might have done so, but he did. Um, he recognized that it was vital to keep this information confidential so he could continue to monitor what the Soviets were up to with his U-2 spy plane. He also, as I mentioned, thought it was important to balance our national programs. Uh, he didn't want to create a new program, a new bureaucracy. He did think that spending money on national security was a necessity. After all, he had come um, from a military background. He recognized the importance of defense. But he also thought if we overspent on things that we didn't need, it would cause a negative impact on our economy. And in fact, he insisted that the Department of Defense keep their spending in check under his presidency. He was able to balance the budget uh, many times during his presidency, even though he was rolling out new missile programs and the interstate program. So if I can have the next slide, please. So this is a, this is a graph. I'm not very good at uh, graphs, but this is a, a graph that I came up with based on um, some readings that I have talking about how many people thought that Sputnik and its launch was the most important problem facing the nation. As you can see, it didn't rate very highly, uh, even in October of 57. I mean, it's, it's pretty minor compared to other issues facing the country. And really by the end of October in 57, most Americans had really lost track of what had happened with Sputnik. Uh, there was a news, Newsweek public opinion survey that found um, that there really wasn't much concern. There was a Newsweek reporter in Boston, and he said most people tended to be very indifferent to the idea. And at the October 30th press conference, there weren't any questions about Sputnik. But what was interesting is Arnold Fretkin remembers that, that time, 
And he said that the media was historical or hysterical rather on that subject. Um, the people in the Eisenhower administration spent a lot of time denying that there was any sort of race going on, but the press insisted that we were in a race. So you were in a race whether or not you want it to be. So if I can get the next slide. So I think the real turning point came with the launch of Sputnik 2. Uh, this is a photo of the dog that was launched into space uh, on their second satellite. And I think this worried Americans even more because they were able to send a live creature into space. And this launch of a dog, uh, some people have called it the case of the dog wagging the world. Uh, the Secretary of State under Eisenhower, John Foster Dulles, called this a circus act, but it, he said, you know, we really need to pay more attention. We have to take things seriously at this point. And the Eisenhower administration, though, kept coming out and saying, well, you know, they may have a capability, but they don't have um, the guidance yet. They don't have reentry mastered. Um, and there was no, no indication they thought that they had an operational ICBM. But still the media insisted, Time and Life in particular, insisted that Eisenhower take action, that he actually do something uh, instead of just talking. And so there are some Americans who start to rethink things, like an engineer who ends up being our center director at the Johnson Space Center, uh, later Robert Gilruth, uh, when he heard about Sputnik 2 and saw that a dog had gone up, he said, my God, we better get going because it's going to be a legitimate program to put a human in space. Now, Eisenhower himself really misunderstood this situation. Um, he didn't think it was a big deal, but for most Americans, it ended up being a larger uh, issue than he anticipated. He lost quite a bit of popularity, uh, 22 points from January 1957 to November of 1957, even though he was really trying to act as what one historian referred to as the cheerleader in chief and saying we weren't any further behind the Soviet Union. It wasn't as bad as the media had portrayed things. Um, Eisenhower, Eisenhower really just had a challenge to deal with the media. You know, the media uh, were excited by the Soviet crisis. It gave them an opportunity to sell newspapers and, and get people interested, uh, gave them an opportunity to sell syndicated stories. Um, but in doing so, Eisenhower began to lose control of the narrative of his agenda. And so as we'll discuss in these next few slides, um, Sputnik presented an opportunity for folks outside of the White House to advance their agenda on space flight. So if I can get the next slide here. So one of the groups that was highly critical of the Eisenhower administration uh, and his response to Sputnik was the aerospace industry. And you can see here on the left, this is a full page ad that appeared in the New York Times. And it's very interesting. I'm, unfortunately, you can't see it because the, the font is so tiny, but um, they're really arguing for the president to take action. Uh, you know, they argue as many people do. You see this constantly throughout the, uh, the Sputnik era. The nation that controls space controls the world. They control human destiny. Uh, they advocate for a new cabinet post, a science department, a space program, a plan to put a man on the moon. Um, they're really using fear to stoke the president uh, to take action. And the aerospace uh, companies, of course, are very interested in a space program because that would mean they could compete for lucrative government contracts. So it would be beneficial to them. Um, the ad on the right, I didn't include the whole ad, uh, but this is from Texas Instruments at the time. And you can see they're really demonstrating how they'll change the economy as a result of this new space age. We'll move from more of an agricultural economy into an aerospace economy, thanks to this new space age. We can get the next slide. So uh, this, this is interesting to me. This is a, a book that I was able to find. Um, there were a lot of spaceflight enthusiasts who were uh, very interested in the United States creating a space program. And this really illustrates the, the point that I'm making here. Um, and you see down at the bottom, six steps to outer space. 
And so they're talking about a manned satellite, a man on the moon, a space station, interplanetary travel. Some of these are steps that NASA ended up taking, of course. And it really, to me, reflects the attitude of the American Rocket Society. They actually came up with a plan, a 25-year plan, uh, of space exploration after the launch of Sputnik. Um, and they really wanted a new civilian space agency. But Eisenhower disagreed with these type of plans. He said, you know, he'd like to know really what was on the other side of the moon, but he wouldn't pay to find out in 1957. You know, he really could care less if we went to the moon. He was much more interested in developing this race against the Soviet Union in terms of ICBMs and IRBMs. If I can get the uh, next slide. So uh, this is Werner von Braun. He is a spaceflight enthusiast and engineer at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency for the Army. And he had been an advocate for spaceflight uh, for many years. Colliers had actually published uh, a number of articles about his interest in spaceflight over the years, including his plans for a space station. Uh, in November of 1957, you see on the left, um, a multi-page spread of Von Braun. It's very interesting, lots of photos, a short interview with him. Uh, he was highly magnetic. Lots of people found him um, very interesting. They were swayed by his ideas. Um, and in the interview himself, he talks about the fact that Russians are turning out more scientists. Uh, you know, we need to move forward. He said, after World War II, we were delayed. We, we didn't get started quickly enough on an ICBM. And he said, finally, one day we decided to have an ICBM. And he said, it was like telling the Bright brothers to build a B-29. Uh, you know, it's this huge leap. And he really starts to encourage America to create a space program, but he wants it in the Department of Defense. Obviously, he's, he's working for the Army. Um, and, you know, he said, because we didn't want to tie space to the military, now the Russians have this giant leap uh, over us. You know, they might be able to get to the moon within a year. Um, he wants to send a man into space and he starts advocating himself for an actual agency with a budget of about one and a half billion dollars. If I can get the next slide, please. Not to be left out, of course, we have the Air Force. They are extremely interested in using space to fight the Cold War. Um, they want to fight our national security war uh, in space. So we have here on the right, Lieutenant General Donald Putt, who tries to encourage Congress to establish a base on the moon from which they can launch missiles on Earth, which sounds like a great idea, right? Um, and then his deputy, Homer Bushi, uh, who's shown on the left, he speaks to the Aero Club in Washington, D.C. And he really saw the moon as the way to be able to watch the Soviets, uh, and see what they were doing. And he said, whoever gains the ultimate supremacy of space gains control, total control over the earth for the purpose of tyranny or for the service of freedom. So this is how we're going to win the Cold War, essentially. If I may get the next slide. And of course, political opponents of Eisenhower really took this on as an issue. The Democratic Party uh, really used this against the Republicans to their benefit. Um, Sputnik was an opportunity for them to advance their agenda. And Mike Mansfield, who was a Democrat, said, what's at stake is nothing less than our survival. Lyndon Johnson became heavily involved in this effort when he was shown a memo that said, uh, he could win the presidency on this issue. It was really a wedge issue for them. And so at the time, he was majority leader of the Senate, and he decides to hold hearings on American preparedness. And he actually worked with Eileen Galloway, who we heard from earlier in this presentation. Uh, they invited scientists to come testify um, and really put Eisenhower and the Republicans on the defense. Um, they really want to damage their reputation and... Uh, scientists, of course, testify that the United States is well behind the Soviet Union. Um, we needed to prioritize science and research in this country. Uh, and the Democrats said that, that the Republicans were responsible because Eisenhower kept sticking to his guns. He wanted a balanced budget. He didn't want to spend more for defense and space and other activities, even though Congress was more than willing to provide 
the uh, the money to open the purse strings, so so to speak. Uh, what, what's interesting to me is Eisenhower's not a, a fan of debt. I've read that he didn't even like to play poker for fear of losing his family's money. Um, of course, members of Congress are calling for a new uh, position, a new cabinet post of science and technology. Uh, one of the senators from Missouri, Senator Symington, said that Sputnik was a technical Pearl Harbor. Um, so, you know, they're, they're all challenging this, uh, this narrative that Eisenhower had that we are ahead of the Soviet Union. And so these hearings really, um, they have a negative impact on Eisenhower. Um, they challenge his authority, you know, Eisenhower's ability to reassure America that we are in fact ahead really under, is undercut by these hearings. Um, of course, LBJ continues to go after Eisenhower. He gives this speech uh, two days before the State of the Union, and he blamed Eisenhower for balancing the budget for crippling uh, our nation's satellite program. And just as you've heard before, you know, he said control of space means control of the world. And so some people, you know, in the media thought that, wow, this was going above and beyond. Uh, life said, you know, never before had anyone in the Democratic Party gone against such such a popular president. Um, so a lot of these groups are working together to challenge the administration and force the administration to consider some space policy that it hadn't considered before. So if I can get the next slide. So I think eventually the administration is, is coming to see that that they need to do something. They need to provide some demonstration that the United States isn't as far behind as the American public thinks that we are. And so, you know, they're encouraging the folks who are working on the Vanguard satellite to uh, to move things up a bit. They uh, they want to move forward. The Navy is actually concerned. There's a test program in December. They're concerned that maybe it won't go off very well. Um, but the Eisenhower administration wants to see some action. And so, you know, this kind of contradicts this idea that, that Eisenhower doesn't want a space race because he's pushing these folks, even though they're saying, well, it might not go so well, might not work so well. Um, but he's saying we need to put a satellite in orbit as soon as possible. And so, you know, the unintended consequence of this, of course, is the feeling that now we are involved in a space race uh, with the Soviet Union. Um, the Army, of course, is still pushing for their satellite. Werner von Braun is insisting that they can use their modified Redstone missile um, and get something up into space within 60 days. So let's take a look at this video and see what happens with Vanguard. So the media, of course, sees this. This is all public. All of the uh, the launches uh, for the United States are, are very public, and, and many of the early launches are not successful. Um, the media called this um, Flopnik, Dudnik, Kaputnik, uh, you name it. Uh, and so the president's ability to reassure Americans that we were really further ahead didn't really hold much water once people saw this. Uh, on the nightly news or, or just heard about it in the press. So let's get the next slide. So on January 31st, 1958, uh, the first American satellite was launched, Explorer 1. Interestingly enough, you know, I mentioned to you that, that Eisenhower wanted to keep space um, really a civ civilian effort. Um, Werner von Braun was involved in this. Any effort to tie this to the military was really um, stricken from press materials. They 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 weren't included, um, so I think that was a that was a big deal. Um, as an aside, I should point out that Texas Instruments uh, used some of their silicone devices for these instrumentation electronics. Now, when they were finally able to put the satellite in space, Eisenhower remembered uh, saying, "That's wonderful. I sure feel a lot better now." So definitely something. If we can get the next slide. Now, once Explorer 1 was launched, you know, how did Eisenhower deal with the issue of space? We finally have our first satellite in space. Well, Eisenhower starts 
looking towards uh, scientists for their feedback, for their assistance, and you know their help with all of these scientific challenges that are popping up in his administration. So four days after we see the launch of Explorer One, he nominates uh, and appoints uh, Killian to be uh, his science advisor, his presidential science advisor. Uh, he was president of MIT at the time. Uh, he was basically known as his science wizard. Uh, and historian Robert Devine said it was probably the most important step that Eisenhower took following the launch of Sputnik 2. And really, Eisenhower starts to elevate a lot of scientists, um, really to restore the nation's confidence after the launch of Sputnik. Uh, what's interesting, though, is as the presidential advisor, he actually told Congress that they could put a lunar probe into orbit by 1959. And Eisenhower said, I'd rather have a good redstone than hit the moon. I don't think we have an enemy on the moon. <laughs> so he had to kind of curtail things. Uh, but again, Eisenhower really wanted to avoid duplication of effort. He didn't want to jump into any sort of crash program without really understanding what things were going to cost. Uh, he didn't want to be involved in a space race. He thought that was an expensive stunt and really wanted a balanced budget. And so Killian played an important role in his administration in, in keeping space research uh, focused on science. If I can get the next slide. So Eisenhower also created the President's Science Advisory Committee, or PSAC, and Killian was in charge of this um, and in December of 1957, this group reached a consensus that we needed to create a civilian space agency that would be focused on space and it would be headed by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. That would be the best agency to control space. And Killian advised Eisenhower on this, who responded positively to the idea that we have a civilian agency, um, that we have space policy driven by scientists, not by the military, and he asked them to start working on legislation. Now, what's interesting to me is that Eisenhower, um, you know, he didn't really get involved in the minutia of details during his administration. He expected other people to handle those details. He made the big decisions. He was like a CEO, but he expected other people to do the implementation for them. And when it came to science policy, he really had uh, relied on these scientists in, in PSAC and Killian. Um, you know, he was a general. And so, you know, he was relying on his skills as a general to put people in the right place at the right time. So at the same time, though, he's what's called a reluctant racer. He's still not interested in having this race with the Soviet Union. Um, he recognizes that if we got involved in a race, yes, we could increase U.S. prestige but it would be very costly. And he didn't think it really would add any value to our national security or our economy. And NASA really wasn't a creation that he wanted. He was simply being forced to create NASA. So if I can get the next slide. In 1968, um, the PSAC actually released something called the Introduction to Outer Space. And this is uh, part of what Eisenhower wrote in, in the brochure. And it really emphasized the importance of promoting the peaceful uses of space, uh, not, as a, use, not using space as a theater of war. You know, as I said several times here, Eisenhower wasn't interested in getting involved in, in a race with the Russians. Um, he wasn't going to set any early goals for a, a lunar probe or a manned expedition to the moon. Um, and neither did PSAC in this report. Um, they basically weren't giving into this Sputnik hysteria. They were trying to calm things down. And I think the release of this publication really helped the Eisenhower administration to, to calm, to soothe the Americans, um, and allowed Eisenhower to gain some sense of control over space policy. Now, on April 2nd, uh, 1958, Eisenhower uh, addresses Congress and he says, you know, we should um, create NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Agency uh, that should be involved in civilian, not military uh, projects of space. So if I can get the next slide. So what's interesting to me about this, this is uh, after the uh, signature on the NASA Act 
This is the only image that, that we have in our repository here down in Houston, um, which says a lot. Uh, so when Eisenhower signed this bill, he said, this is a historic step further equipping the United States for leadership in space. And you know, he commended Congress for um, enacting the bill so promptly. They, uh, he ended up signing the bill in July of 1958. NASA came into existence in October of 1958. Uh, what is surprising to me is there's not a lot of information either on America's interest in the creation of NASA. Uh, there seemed to be very little fanfare over um, the signing of the act. Um, and like I said, this is the only image that we have in our repository. Uh, on our left, you see Hugh Dryden, who was the deputy of NASA at the time. And on the right, you see the first NASA administrator, T. Keith Glennon. Um, now Eisenhower selected Glennon to be head of the agency. He was a Republican. Uh, he believed in many of the things that Eisenhower believed in. Uh, he was fiscally conservative. He didn't believe in government intrusion uh, in many activities of life. Um, he had a great deal of vision in terms of uh, one's civic responsibilities. And, you know, he really appreciated the importance of science and technology, just as Eisenhower did. He also insisted he wouldn't take the post unless Hugh Dryden, who had previously worked for NACA, stayed on as deputy. Let me get the next slide. This is an image of Eisenhower and Glennon. And I was able to find an interview with Glennon talking about their relationship, which I, th I think is really interesting because most presidents don't work very closely with their NASA administrators. They appoint them, but they've got other much bigger fish to fry. But Glennon actually spent a lot of time working with Eisenhower and he explained why. He said, one, we were starting something new, NASA, a new agency. And two, there was a real empathy between us. He said, uh, I was a conservative. I wasn't a space cadet. Neither was Ike. He enunciated that several times. I wasn't as quite and frank in saying that I wasn't a space cadet in those days. And so when asked, what did you mean by you weren't a space cadet and Eisenhower wasn't a space cadet? He said, I think this is a reflection again of my aversion to crash programs. I'm neither a scientist nor an engineer, really, although I have an engineering degree. I guess I'm a manager. I have an interest in people, how you get people to do things. And when Ike was being pounded upon to go to the moon, he said, you know, the moon's been there for eons. It's going to be there for eons more. If we get there next year or 50 years from now, it doesn't make any difference. I know we'll get there, but it isn't necessary that we do it now. I so thoroughly agreed with that, and I so thoroughly agreed with knowing uh, what we were doing step by step that we build on success, that we not take chances. So if I can get the next slide. So this is an image of the Mercury 7, the first astronaut selected by NASA. And in the first week of NASA's existence, they became tasked with working on a manned satellite program. Uh, Glennon actually approved the program. He told Bob Gilruth, who I spoke of earlier, uh, let's just get on with it. So they started working on uh, this program. Um, there was some discussion about who should be selected to fly as astronauts in this program. And Eisenhower, who had helped to select the U-2 pilots, uh, thought that we should be selecting test pilots. Now, what's interesting about this is Eisenhower didn't want NASA to really publicize the astronauts, but NASA went ahead and really, really publicized them. Uh, that's another talk for another time, though. What's also interesting to me is that when NASA asked for additional funding for the program in 1959 and 1960, the president was really reticent. He didn't think that manned spaceflight was such an important or vital issue to the country, right? Every dollar you spent on human spaceflight meant you couldn't spend a dollar somewhere else. And so uh, he didn't really see any practical benefit to human spaceflight. If I can get the next slide. So this is an image of Eisenhower when he goes to visit the Marshall Space Flight Center. So this is another important role that I think Eisenhower plays. He finally comes to the conclusion that the Army Ballistic Missile Agency under which Von Braun is working on the Saturn rocket has to be transferred to NASA. And he does it primarily because of budgetary numbers. Budget drives him quite a bit. And so in 1960, um, that becomes the Marshall Space Flight Center, named, of course, for his good friend and colleague, uh, George Marshall. 
Uh, and he actually goes down to Huntsville, Alabama, where the site is located. Uh, he gives a speech, um, which Glennon talks about in his uh, diary and says, you know, it, it was well received, but wasn't the type that would cause great outbursts of enthusiasm and applause. And they dedicate the site. They travel all over the site. He's got lots of questions for Von Braun, who was working on the Saturn rocket, which will eventually take men to the moon. Uh, he talks about how they were photographed probably three or 400 times while they were out there. If I can get the next slide, I'm trying to stick closely to our time here. So at the end of our, his presidency, Eisenhower gives a farewell address. And this is a very well-known speech. Um, anyone who's taking a, a US history course has heard of this speech and Eisenhower um, expressing concerns over trends that he saw with the military industrial complex. But there's another concern that he raises in this speech and that is that the US might be held captive to a scientific technological elite. So let's hear a bit from this speech. Akin to and largely responsible for the sweeping changes in our industrial military posture has been the technological revolution during recent decades. In this revolution, research has become central. It also becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. A steadily increasing share is conducted for, by, or at the direction of the federal government. Today, the solitary inventor, tinkering in his shop, has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. It is the task of statesmanship to mold, to balance, and to integrate these and other forces, new and old, within the principles of our democratic system ever aiming toward the supreme goals of our free society. So when he was asked about this scientific elite, uh, you know, who was he afraid of? He actually said he had a couple scientists in mind and those were Edward Teller and also Werner von Braun. So, you know, I, th I think it's very interesting. You know, he talks about the importance of, of balancing, but also the fact that, uh, you know, government policy needs to be, uh, needs to take into consideration all of our needs, not just uh, the needs of companies, not just the needs of science, but government has a lot of responsibilities. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. I've just got a few more here. So uh, in 1960, John F. Kennedy, is, as you know, uh, beat fight Vice President Richard Nixon in the presidential election. And in 1961, he commits the United States to sending a man to the moon and returning him safely by the end of the decade. Now, Dwight D. Eisenhower did not believe that the United States should rush headfirst into these type of programs uh, to beat the Soviets into space. You know, he wanted a more ju judicious approach um, he didn't want to spend large amounts of money on these type of projects. Of course, John F. Kennedy uh, did so, and then Lyndon Johnson was involved in that as well. Uh, under the Eisenhower administration, NASA was interested in sending men to the moon. They had actually started working on studying how we might get there. Um, but Eisenhower didn't view that as a priority for this nation. 
Um, he couldn't care less whether or not we went to the moon. And he actually was dismissive of NASA plans and wanted to say so in a speech. And he even thought in 1961 that there really was no need for man in space beyond the, the Mercury project. If I can get the next slide. So this is a letter from Dwight D. Eisenhower. You can see his stationery at the top. Um, astronaut Frank Borman had written a letter to the former president who was hypercritical of the Apollo program that was established by Kennedy. Um, he took issue with a lot of comments that Eisenhower had made. And he told him, those who, of us who have dedicated our careers to the program don't consider it to be a stunt because really that's what Eisenhower thought it was. Um, and Eisenhower replies to him in this letter, as you see here, what I've criticized about the current space program is the concept under which it was drastically revised and expanded after the Bay of Pigs fiasco in 1961. The president of the United States announced that this nation challenged the Russians to a race to the moon implying that the prestige of the USA would be riding on this issue. This, I thought, was unwise. If I can get the last slide, please. So as reflected in this letter, which I think you might be able to read most of it, Eisenhower thought the Apollo program was, was nuts, hysterical, as a stunt. Uh, he was always sarcastic when people brought up the issue to him. Um, you know, any of you fellas want to go to the moon? I don't. And so, as we've talked about today, the race really was on once Sputnik had launched, uh, but the president never saw Sputnik as a security risk. Uh, he didn't see it as a reason for us to establish a space program or to go on the moon. You know, we didn't have any enemies on the moon. No one lived on the moon. Uh, but still, he was forced to establish NASA as a result of Sputnik. He gave the space agency the authority to work on Project Mercury he also gave them the Saturn rocket, which was used then to fly men to the moon. He ended up dying before the first lunar landing in 1969. But I really think his space policy decisions helped lay the foundation for the space race. Uh, he lost control of his orderly agenda. He lost control of the narrative, uh, all because of Sputnik. You know, if he had been maybe a better speaker, you've, you've seen his speeches in a couple of spots here in this presentation, or really shared what he knew about the U-2, uh, we might have had a different outcome. He might have blazed a different trail for us. Uh, but of course, without NASA, we would not have accomplished one of the greatest engineering accomplishments of the 20th century, which is landing a man on the moon. Uh, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you, Dr. Ross Nizel. Uh, at this time, if you have questions, if you are online, I'm, I don't think anyone's on the phone, you can um, mute yourself and ask your question, or you can type it in the chat, and I'd be happy to ask it for you. Okay, we have Ethan Anderson who says, why was Eisenhower against publicizing who the first astronauts were? You know, I've, I had not come across why he was against that. Um, the only thing that, that I can think of is that, uh, you know, he wasn't, as I said, very supportive of human spaceflight. And all of these guys were going to be coming from the military as, as test pilots. And he probably didn't think that was appropriate uh, in some way. But I haven't come across any reason why. Okay, well, while we wait on other people to type their questions or ask their questions, I have one. You sort of alluded to this, but I wanted to maybe see a little bit here, a little bit more details. But in um, this current educational environment, because I'm an educator, STEM and STEAM is, you know, a big, big deal and has been for years. I mean, coming along, it was big. They didn't call it STEM and STEAM, but science uh, education was a big deal. And um, do you think feel like the Cold War and the launch of Sputnik, did that, was that the catalyst? Um, you know, from because from an educator's perspective, you know, historically it was, you know, it was the classics and things like that, that, you know, that were really emphasized. And then all of a sudden it was this big push for science. And do you think it was, it was specifically Sputnik or the Cold War or, or, or what? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I definitely think, I mean, Sputnik is part of the Cold War, but I think Sputnik is definitely that catalyst because so many people were concerned about our educational system. That's, that seems to be a common theme here in American history. People are extremely concerned. American education needs reform. And of course, then we see the National Defense Education Act uh, to try and get students to study these fields of science, engineering, mathematics. Um, you know, and I know several people who uh, receive scholarships as a result of that act, trying to bring more students into those fields. Of course, now, now we're seeing that again, you know, they're the big push for, for STEM education, but that definitely came out of, of Sputnik. And that was something Eisenhower definitely got behind as well. Are there any other questions? Okay, will this be available on the library website? Yes, um, give us a few, usually it takes a few days for us to get it all together, um, but it'll get up on, we'll get it up to YouTube as soon as possible. It won't be on the website, it'll be on our YouTube page. And correct me if I'm wrong, Samantha. So one of the other questions I did have is you were talking about that Eisenhower was a little bit indifferent to, you know, the launch of Sputnik and all of that. Um, was it really because I know you said some of he didn't think it was that big of a deal, but I mean, part of me kind of feels like maybe it was because he had a lot more pressing things going on. I mean, at the time, it's 1957, the Civil Rights Act is happening, Little Rock is happening, mm -hmm. you know, what it seems like, you know, maybe he just thought, eh, I have other things to worry about. Yes, and there there are certainly are you know I think people who um, who study space history tend to you know really focus in on the weeds. You kind of need to pull back out and see what was happening in the country at that point. And there were certainly plenty of other issues that Eisenhower was dealing with. But I cert I, I do think having those those photos from the U two spy plane really contributed. Really made him feel quite comfortable and confident in knowing that we were not as far behind as the Democrats thought. And I think he was also just this very, as you saw in these presentations uh, or these press conferences and talks, he was just a very calm individual, very calm president, you know, was, was thinking through his decisions. Um, he really wasn't uh, like a showboat or, or anything, you know, he, he worked a lot behind the scenes um, and, and really knew what was going on. He was a, a military man. And certainly I think if Eisenhower said, this is a risk to our national security, he, he or thought that it was a risk to our national security, he would have taken the initiative to do more. But I think that, that he knew how far ahead we were. Plus he had other, Plans. You know, he was very interested in reconnaissance satellites and, um, you know, different aspects of, of space, not just uh, putting, like he said, a stunt. You know, uh, one of our uh, NASA administrators at the time referred to it as a uh, shooting a lady out of a cannon, you know, that definitely just kind of a circus act at that point. Um, not to say that it was, but that's how people viewed it. There were a lot of people. Uh, even within NASA, who discouraged many of the younger folks coming up to go work at the Space Task Group, which was charged with the Project Mercury effort, because they said, you know, space is sort of this passing fancy. You know, once Project Mercury gets done, we're not going to have any jobs for you when you get back. So you might want to consider whether or not you want to go and work on Mercury. Now, most of them ended up taking those jobs and made a lifelong career out of space. But that sort of was the feeling even amongst some of the engineers who were working uh, in Virginia and, and for NACA before NASA was created. Wow. Um, well, it doesn't seem like we have, oh, we do have a question. You showed a clip from Homer Hickman. How do NASA profess professionals feel about the Rocket Boys in October Sky? Well, I, you know, I can't say how they feel about it, but I know that I, I enjoyed uh, the film and reading the book. It's been many years, uh, but, you know, anything that, that 
talks about that time period and gets kids and, and adults interested in NASA and learning more about the space race, I think is great. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up because we are, you know, a little over time since we started yeah. late. Um, I do want to recognize Jim Remar from the Cosmosphere again, uh, specifically because the Cosmosphere is here in Kansas and not very far from us. So we want to recognize the work that they're doing. And if you want to learn more about space um, or NASA and space exploration, please visit the Cosmosphere. They're friends of ours. Um, I want to say thank you to um, Dr. Ross Nazelle. Um, and then just uh, a few housekeeping things uh, while we wrap up. Give Samantha just a little bit of time to bring up the slides, or I'm not sure if she has the slides. All right, our 2020 public program series is made possible thanks to the Eisenhower Foundation and the Jeff Cope Foundation. This was our last program for 2021. So thank you so much for tuning in with us all year long. And please, please, please keep a lookout uh, for our 2022 programming that is coming. Working very, very hard on getting that together. We hope to bring you a great slate of programs. So thank you so much. Thank you again, Dr. Ross Nazelle. And you all have a wonderful, wonderful day.